Hello class, welcome to chapter 11 lecture. You may have noticed that last week we didn't have a lecture. That was me trying to make sure that everybody's still reading and looking at the PowerPoints and it showed excellent performance on the test. So thank you everybody for reading, continuing with the PowerPoints and checking out everything that the class has to offer. A couple things that I want you to remember on chapter 10. The first one is your DUIs. In the final, we're going to talk a little bit more about DUIs, and I'm going to ask you some questions about that. Commonly in the United States, DUIs, there's two parts to them. And what I mean about two parts is there's usually um, a tolerance that they put. Like you're um, convicted or you're guilty of a DUI if your blood alcohol content was above a 0 0.08 or maybe a 0 0.06 or a 0 0.10. Well, there's the first part. The second part is impaired to the slightest degree. Impaired to the slightest degree, that could be many, many things. You could have a blood alcohol content of 0 0.02, but yet you were swerving and you weren't able to control the vehicle, keep it on the road. Um, you were doing different things. You were impaired. So that's almost a catch all that um, the law gives where we just have to prove you are impaired slightly to the slightest degree. Or the strict liability part in that uh, blood alcohol content of a 0 0.08 or above. So you're guilty if you blew a breathalyzer and you are a 0 0.10. Um, I've been seeing many, many high breathalyzers, some 0.25. One time I was even told a person blew a 0.35, which Kind of crazy, that means 35% of your blood was alcohol. Extremely dangerous because it's killing off cells in your brain, in your body. Your body just can't process that. The next I want you to know about is disorderly conduct. Disorderly conduct is a catch-all crime. It's something that many things can fall into. The only thing that you have to prove for disorderly conduct is that your actions cause some kind of wrongful fear or um, sickness or something in another person, a victim almost. So maybe that could be public intoxication. Maybe it could be um, someone fighting in the streets, someone doing anything slightly. That could be um, disorderly conduct. A lot of people put on their midterm that a victimless crime was suicide. And I try to respond to that and saying, well, if suicide's a crime, who do you charge with that? And what could the punish punishments be for suicide? It took some research to find out that many, many, many states, all states here in the United States, don't um, prosecute suicide. You can't. There's not a person nor... Um, can you put punishments on someone who's dead? Back in England, I think it was all the way till about the 1960s, they actually had a law against suicide. So talking to one of our prosecutors, one of our county prosecutors, I asked him the question, how many people have you prosecuted for suicide? And he said, none. Um, kind of laughed about it too, and I mentioned to him about the class. And he says, one way that someone could get charged for maybe an attempted suicide is with that disorderly conduct. If they did something and it caused a fear in someone or a sickness or they were just um, ashamed, something happened. Um, let's say they were out in front and they shot themselves and they caused a big wreck or, um, wreck or something. That person and they survived, they could get charged with disorderly conduct. So for those, for chapter 10, remember those two terms, the DUI and disorderly conduct, because you're going to see several questions about those on the final. All right, so let's get into now chapter 11. In chapter 11, I want to talk about several subjects of it only. That's going to be terrorism. I want to talk about human trafficking and treason. So starting off with terrorism. What is it? The book defines terrorism as the commission of some kind of crime, a traditional crime, 
with intention to coerce or influence a specific group or government through fear or intimidation. So what does that mean? What that means is one group doesn't have to be a nation or a simple religion or anything um, or ethnicity. It just has to be a group. Um, we see this a lot like um, with ISIS. ISIS could be people made up of many different religions, um, but they're just a specific group and they have a specific target, maybe a specific population, like that could be the Muslims, um, Jewish people, could be Americans themselves. Well, they do some kind of criminal act to try to influence us um, to do something out of fear or intimidation. The big famous one is the 9-11 attacks. And I ask all of you, do you remember any thought of terrorism in our minds before the 9-11 attacks? I can't say that I do and that I remember I was in middle school when the 9-11 attacks happened. So I want to tell you that historically, terrorism has not been a topic of people's lives here in the United States. Meaning, throughout history, we haven't really thought about terrorism. Just recently, and especially in this past decade, have us Americans actually talked about terrorism, have thought about terrorism. That's because it's coming up more and more. More radical groups are coming into the United States or are targeting different populations that the United States has. Um, it's been about 18, 17 years um, since the 9-11 attacks, and yet we're still dealing with this terrorism. It's a constant war, and we're always constantly going to have to deal with it. Um, so now, terrorism, it's not only a topic here just in the United States, but it's a discussion, it's a topic for international and domestic laws. So now we have laws that govern terrorism within the United States and then also throughout um, different international countries and so. So we're trying to really crack down, not just as the United States, but internationally. Um, one thing I do want you all to remember is, it's gonna be a question on a test. Terrorism, that's only inciting some kind of fear or intimidation. There doesn't necessarily have to be a murder or killing in terrorism. Terrorism can come in many different forms. Usually people get hurt, but a lot of times people don't die from it. One story and one subject that I um, did a lot of research on at ASU, this was about some of the Chinese subways up in China where one group was trying to target um, the specific group and religion that was taking the subway at, this, at a certain time. And this person in a group, they developed um, a chemical, like a risin type chemical. Well, they tried to make it and luckily they made it just slightly wrong and they opened it up within the subway um, of that population in China and it ended up not killing anybody because they mismeasured the ingredients, but it caused a ton of people to get sick and people to be hospitalized. That was deemed an act of terrorism. They found the person and China, they actually executed that person. So to show again, terrorist acts don't actually have to kill somebody or cause murders of several people or any persons. So, what does the government do now about terrorism? The government's focus on terrorism is prevention. They want to prevent terrorism. They also want to prosecute and punish the people that are involved in terrorism. But the highest concern is prevention. That can be with national security, national defense, international um, borders, international treaties, and international wars as we're seeing. Most laws that are created about against terrorism, those are what are called non-state laws. They're mostly federal or international. Yes, in Arizona, we have some laws against terrorism, 
But if an act was to happen, it would be carried out and handled through courts that not necessarily in the state, but it would be federal. So they would be non-states. So this brings me to the U.S. Patriot Act. The U.S. Patriots, Patriot Act. This was almost immediately acted, enacted right after the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Centers. It's an act that's going to be constantly scrutinized. And that is because the U.S. Patriot Act, it gave federal law enforcement more power. So what kind of powers did it give them? The big one that's going to be in scrutiny is it allows the government to wiretap, to um, trace our emails, to hack into our emails, see all our information with the intent of trying to stop terrorism. So a debate on that is where does it stop? Where does it protect us and our Fourth Amendment right for um, against unlawful search and seizure? That's going to be a big debate um, coming up, and it's going to be constant. It's kind of giving up a little bit of our freedom for our safety. I don't know if any of you um, are a fan of the U.S. Patriot Act or you're not a fan of the Patriot Act. It's something that maybe we'll do a discussion or extra credit act extra credit assignment is to talk more about that. So also in studying terrorism, we kind of think about in prevention of terrorism, where would be some most likely targets that terrorists would attack or they would target us? Well, let's think about locally here in the Gila Valley. What would be one of the biggest ways that a terrorist can target our population and cause some kind of harm or fear um, cause some kind of crime to us? Well, the easiest way is um, through our water system. We get our water from, I believe, it's called like the Gila Box Reservoir. That there, if the terrorists happen to infiltrate that and contaminate our water, that would reach all the citizens here in the Gila Valley. That would be a quick, um, easy target for the terrorists. So we have ways of preventing that and protecting it. I wanted to share that with you because I want you to see there's ways rather than just bombing and kidnapping and torturing that terrorists get to us. They can get to us through our water systems, through our air supply, through causing salmonella in certain salads at a, a country or a state. There's many different ways that terrorists can get to us and there's constant combatants against them. Now let's get into human trafficking. Human trafficking, this is one of the fastest growing crimes that we're seeing in the United States. We're seeing it a ton here in Arizona. When I deal with probationers, especially juveniles, um, we send them to detention sometimes. We we're trained in ways to determine if those juveniles were trafficked before. When it comes to trafficking, we see this, it's kind of a legal term of really prostitution or causing them to do work for some kind of non-pay but um, benefit towards another. That's going to come in with also the difference between human trafficking and human smuggling, where human smuggling is taking one person illegally into, let's say, the United States or to somewhere where they're not lawful to um, for them to be and then just leaving it there. Where trafficking can be is if you did that act, you took them, let's say, from Mexico to the United States, thinking they were going to get a job. These people are thinking they were going to get a job. But instead, you threatened them and made them work for you for free. Um, that can be at a restaurant. That could be for sex trades. can be working in a farm or so. That would be considered human trafficking. So people who are trafficked, it's not just international and non-citizens. Citizens of the United States are trafficked. They're kidnapped, then they're trafficked. They could be trafficked in other countries. They can be trafficked here in the United States. It's, only, it's a disgusting trade that's around. And you can, once you know about it, you can start picking out and seeing it. You're seeing people at the malls, young girls where people are watching them, odd people. It's something that is coming more and more, especially close to the border, um, the states that are surrounded by borders. 
And again, trafficking, human trafficking, is not just for sex. It can be for labor, can be for many other things. All right, last one that I want to talk about, and that's treason. Treason is levying war against or supporting the enemy of uh, against one's nation. So, um, treason is something that dates back way, way back to the times where even the Constitution was made. In fact, it's the only crime that is specifically mentioned in the Constitution. It's treason. Well, we don't often get uh, treason charges here in the United States anymore. There's a lot to prove for that. Um, the prosecution, they usually deal with it in a different way, charging them for different acts. But treason, that's where we're supporting another country or one of our, um, one of our enemies, maybe at that time at a war, and causing some kind of harm or just radical support, almost like terrorism, but you don't actually have to do an act or so for that, a criminal act, a physical act. A little confusing, but just know treason, um, it's a little less than terrorism. It's against the country itself. All right, guys. Thank you for listening to the lecture. Hope everybody's having a great week. Um, we're going to keep going. We got only maybe two more chapters, three more chapters left for this class. So I've had several people submit their extra credit assignment. I'm going to keep that open for one more week if anybody else wants to submit that. And then I'm going to open up a new extra credit for this these assignments after the midterm. Um, what I am doing again is I'm picking your lowest assignment, test, quiz, um, forum, something that will benefit you the most, and fixing that grade if you submit your assignment from your lowest grade to the highest to 100%. So if anybody has any questions, please email me, text me, or call me. And again, have a good week.